Hi everyone, please make sure to keep your um, videos off. All right, please make sure to um, keep your videos off and we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Abby and I'm the Clinical Training and Research Institute Coordinator here at Hathaway Sycamore's Child and Family Services. So um, please write any questions that you have in the chat box. On the bottom of your screen, there should be seven different icons that come up. There should be an icon there shaped like a chat box. Please press that icon and type it here so that I know that you found it. As we are using technology, some glitches may occur. If you have any problems, please write them in the chat box and I will assist you. Please make sure to keep yourself muted to reduce any audio disturbances. And also please make sure to keep your videos off to reduce any, um, any disturbances with the presentation. And we will be offering two CAMP slash APA CEs for this course. And for this webinar, we are delighted to have Dr. Christopher Lane join us. Dr. Lane is a licensed clinical psychologist. He is also a program director of the education, program director of education and evidence-based practice at the UCLA slash Duke University National Center for Child Traumatic Stress and a health professional researcher in the, in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Lane has worked with traumatized bereavement and traumatically bereavement youth in settings such as school-based mental health clinics, war, terrorist attacks, school shootings, and grief support centers. He is the lead developer of the Prolonged Grief Disorder Checklist and Multidimensional Grief Theory. Thank you so much once again, and we will be beginning the webinar now. Very good. Thank you, Abby. Um, I, of course. I trust that people can hear me okay. The very first question that I'm, I'm hearing is, will, be, will it, there be handouts for today? And the answer is yes. We'll be sending them out um, um, later today um, or at, at, the, uh, at the latest tomorrow. What I'd like to do instead of uh, having people take lots and lots of notes is just to invite you to follow with me to pay as close attention as you can with the knowledge that we're going to be sending out uh, the, uh, the PowerPoints to you afterwards. So please don't feel uh, compelled to take lots of notes right here. Um, so today's presentation is focusing on preparing for the COVID-19 second wave and an overview of the new prolonged grief disorder through the lens of the multidimensional grief theory. Um, my hope today is, is to help uh, mount a response uh, for how to address the many problems that we're already seeing come up in relation to COVID. And I'm going to be going into those in, in greater detail in just a few minutes. And so here's a reference citation for today's webinar. And I'd like to begin, first of all, by acknowledging I've got a number of friends on the call right here, and I see your names, and it's great to see you here. I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors of data sets and presentations that I'm uh, going to be drawing on quite heavily in today's presentation. Um, I'm going to be drawing heavily on a presentation and a follow-up report that I gave, to, uh, my, my colleagues and I gave to the American Psychiatric Association, uh, both in June of 2019 and then in February of this last year. Um, there were only three teams who were actually invited to present to the American Psychiatric Association at a panel. Um, retreat that they had uh, in June of last of 2019. Um, one team presenting on child and adolescent issues, and uh, I represented that team along with Robert Pinus at the meeting. And the other uh, teams were uh, led by 
by Catherine Shear and Holly Priggerson. Um, and so we're going to be drawing quite heavily on the recommendations that we uh, made for that meeting. I'd also like to just simply acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, the American Psychiatric Association has been quite helpful to us, and also to acknowledge the New York Life Foundation, which uh, funded the development of a grief-informed foundations of treatment. To our knowledge, the very first practice research network uh, that has been created specifically to help bereaved uh, youth and their families, um, as well as the data set that was collected uh, by Julie uh, Capo and her team at uh, the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, with respect to professional disclosures, um, there are a number of them. Um, I'm uh, uh, contributing to the trauma and grief component therapy. We're going to be talking about that and its use as an assessment-driven, modularized approach. Uh, multidimensional grief therapy, which we're currently developing. Uh, multi, uh, the persistent complex bereavement disorder checklist, um, which has been out since 2014. Uh, the prolonged grief disorder checklist, which is pending. We're still working on that, but we hope to have that available soon. I'm uh, currently also a scientific advisor to uh, Behavioral Health Innovations, and um, I also have a private practice. And today's learning objectives, I have five that I'd like to lay out. First of all, is to describe what we mean by the second wave that's emerging from COVID-19 and other epidemics, and the consequent need, uh, the urgent need to create bereavement-informed systems of care. Second is to discuss recent advancements in bereavement care, and that is uh, recent federal recognition of bereavement as a major public health issue. We view this as a major advance because um, now federal agencies are starting to collect and report on data about the services they're providing. And prolonged grief disorder in the DSM-5-TR. It is already official, but it's officially going to be due out in May 2021 in printed form when uh, DSM-5-TR is released, and TR stands for text revised. A third is to describe basic components of a bereavement-informed system of care and how they fit together to provide continuity of care. A fourth is to discuss how multidimensional grief theory supports both grief support of adaptive grieving reactions and therapeutic interventions for severe grief reactions, and that is for more maladaptive reactions that we think are strongly related to functional impairment and risky behavior and, and developmental disruption. And the fifth is to uh, describe practical steps. I've got 15 laid out today to prepare for the advent of uh, PGD in DSM-5-TR and to raise the standard of bereavement care on a local uh, level. That is in your own neighborhood. Uh, but before we begin, let's, uh, let's have some poll questions. And Abby, if you'll help with this. The very first question is, what professionals and paraprofessionals were attending today's presentation? We've got a good number. And so, Abby, can you administer that, please? <clears throat> yes, give me one second. Um, I was going to administer all three of them if you want to go over them. Okay. Real quick. All right. And the second is, how long have you been practicing your profession? And the third is, how many professional continuing education and college or graduate level courses on bereavement and grief have you attended? Okay. okay so I'm gonna, great. I'm, I'm going to open up the polling, and there's going to be about three minutes to answer. And if you are on a full screen, please make sure to exit out. And if you are on a mobile device, you can turn your phone horizontal, and you'll be able to see the polling. Uh, Abby, we have some people reporting in the comments that they can't get audio. Okay, good. All right, Christina says that she can hear me now. That's good. Okay, great. I think it was because we weren't talking for a second, but... Oh, okay. Let me help her with the poll. Give me one second. 
All right. And Abby, how much time are you giving people? Good. She got it. That's great. Awesome. There's about a minute left. Okay. Oh, and Henry is saying there's no option for zero. If that's the case, then put it in the, in the comment box, please. And that is right. We needed to have a zero there. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> My apologies. Okay, so there is a minute remaining. All right. <laughs> Um, my understanding is we've got close to 60 participants on today's uh, webinar, and so I'm expecting a pretty diverse audience. We will see. <laughs> All right, and now there are 30 seconds. Hey, okay, somebody's. Uh, if anyone's. Yeah. If anyone's having trouble, um, you can go ahead and answer in the chat box. Good. So we have some uh, some very experienced people. I'm about to close the poll now. Okay. And sharing the results. All right. Okay. Wow, that is a diverse. That's a diverse group. Okay, so we have psychologists and social workers. I'm seeing marriage and family therapists, mental health counselors. A number no answer. Okay. And a good number of people, well, people have been in practice for, for a broad range. Okay. Awesome. All right. So that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can uh, tailor our talk for a broad and diverse audience. Okay. So let me begin. Um, and I have a, a small confession to make. I did not go to graduate school with the intention of becoming a bereavement researcher and clinician. I went to graduate school with the intention of becoming a marital and family researcher and clinician. And it wasn't until I was working in a school-based uh, clinic as a, a mental health extern during my second year of graduate school that I had a chance to start working with bereaved kids. And to be honest, they were so far more interesting for me to work with than watching squabbling couples on videotapes and coding demand withdrawal interaction. So I made a career change, um, focusing on trauma, but it wasn't until my first year as a postdoctoral fellow that I really fell in love with bereavement as a field. Um, and I had a chance to work with UNICEF as a postdoctoral fellow in the immediate aftermath of the Bosnian War, a few months after it ended. And we trained as many as 32 different schools across the country to implement our intervention. And so built it up from the, from the ground up and trained it uh, across the country. One of our supervisors there, a very wise clinician by the name of uh, Dr. Nadesh Dasanya, one time sat me down when I was consulting with her about the needs of kids in her region. And she very kindly, but very pointedly, made a point and she said, Chris, you're committing a perseveration error. You are acting as if the war is still going on and you're focusing on PTSD. But the war is over and PTSD symptoms are going down. What's going up? Are grief reactions, and you're missing it. You're you're failing to identify grief reactions because those are what our kids are experiencing right now. And when I went back and started to really look at the open-ended responses that kids were giving to us uh, about their most difficult life experiences in the aftermath of the war, it was not uncommon to find comments like "life without father is getting harder and harder." Uh, so really, a lot of very poignant stories from our young people about what it is like to to live without a loved one. In many cases, this was their fathers, their brothers, their uncles, their grandparents. Um, but this is also another time where, frankly, sort of reality hit me over the head and said, grief and PTSD cannot possibly be the same thing if they have such diverse clinical courses. And so I took a real interest in, in grief 
uh, worked harder on developing brief measures, worked not only to develop a measure of trauma reminder exposure, but also loss reminder exposure. And to be honest, that really helped to open my eyes to the, the interplay between PTSD and between grief reactions, between trauma, bereavement, and sometimes traumatic bereavement. But I just wanted to share that with you because oftentimes I don't think we recognize that grief oftentimes can persist even after distress over the particular manner of death can start to recede. So let's also focus on some, some key terms here. Bereavement is the act of losing a loved one or close person through death. Mourning is the ritualized means of recognizing, honoring, and remembering the deceased, and recognize also that we have public mourning rituals, which in many cases COVID has, has greatly interfered with, as well as private mourning rituals. In many cases, things like mementos and T-shirts, cars, tattoos, lighting a candle, et cetera. I had the opportunity to talk with quite a few gang members um, in interviewing about 70 uh, kids for my doctoral dissertation uh, and talk with them about their experiences. And to be honest, grief was oftentimes about the only type of mental distress that they would talk about. But they were proud to share with me their mementos, their T-shirts and so forth, their tattoos in which they memorialized uh, uh, a friend of theirs, a fellow gang member who'd been killed. And grief refers to psychological, emotional, spiritual reactions to bereavement. And uh, in this presentation, I want to lay out a distinction between adapted grief reactions and maladaptive grief reactions. And these are things that I first recognized over in Bosnia when we developed a measure of grief reactions for kids and got a two-factor solution. And one factor correlated rather weakly with depression and PTSD. The other factor correlated strongly with PTSD and depression and school problems. And so it's become uh, one of my fixations for the last 20 years. It's how do we differentiate between adaptive and maladaptive grief reactions? And I want to share what we've come up with uh, uh, during this uh, presentation today. Now, this is uh, a direct quote from the, the committee that petitioned to develop a, a prolonged grief disorder in DSM-5-TR. There's perhaps no other human experience that is as deeply private while being so openly public as being bereft from the death of a loved one. The course of grief reactions is embedded in a cultural envelope of mourning rituals and support that is further positioned under an umbrella of social recognition of the status of being bereaved. So grief itself, mourning and bereavement, really are a triad that are wrapped in, in culture, they're wrapped in development, they're wrapped in so many contextual factors that unless we actually have a conceptual framework that is, allows us to be able to, to contextualize these, we in many cases fail to detect bereavement or uh, we simply cannot properly explain it um, and work with it therapeutically with the leverage we otherwise would have. But before I, I, I go, and I, I, to be honest, in the past I oftentimes talk about self-care at the end of presentations, and I, I want to make a course correction. I'd like to do that early in today's presentation and just simply talk about the importance of self-care uh, being particularly important when working with bereaved populations. Um, if there's ever a, a set of photos that actually I find very poignant, it's this one. This is an ER doctor who tried and failed to save a 19-year-old patient. He worked very hard to save her life um, and could not. And this was taken by the EMT um, the ambulance uh, paramedic who was present and, uh, and took a picture of a doctor quietly grieving. Um, he had to take some time off before he could go back to the ER and attend to his other patients. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we have to do the same thing ourselves. Let me share a story about when I was a psychology extern working in a school-based mental health clinic. And I did that for three years. Um, I, t I spoke with a young woman who was debating about whether she wanted to share, to disclose a difficult life experience. I think it was sexual abuse. And she looked at me very skeptically. And her first question was, who are you going to talk to? And the first thing that came to my mind, of course, was confidentiality. And so I very quickly talked about the, the protections of confidentiality, that, I, uh, that this is protected information. It would only stay in the clinic, et cetera. And she shook her head and she said, no who are you going to talk to? And it suddenly occurred to me that she was concerned that her, that her uh, story was going to be hard for me to hear. And it wasn't until actually I was able to assure her 
that I had my own sort of um, social safety net, that I had my own professional support network, but she chose to disclose that story to me and allow me to help her. But I would like to say um, we oftentimes need to convey to our clients that we can hear their stories. Um, and so that self-care needs to translate into a message that we can convey and with, with confidence to our clients. Abby, I'm trying to change, I'm trying to advance to the next slide, and I'm, okay, there we go. All right. So let's talk about self-care, self-nurturing, and self-protection, even as it, for example, applies in today's uh, presentation. Recognize your own limitations and vulnerabilities. And don't push beyond your ability to tolerate. Um, listening to losses can be powerful reminders of our own losses. And we found that assessing children of ages close to our own children if we're parents can evoke powerful uh, emotions and make our own work much more difficult. And so I recommend that you create a referral network of people you can refer to who can work with cases that would be very difficult for you. And uh, that also includes <clears throat> seeking support. You're welcome to write to me, for example, um, after today's presentation or to post comments. Let's talk about our first learning objective, and that is our modern epidemic. Um, the first part of this presentation is going to be a bit front-loaded with uh, some facts, um, in part just simply because of what we're facing with COVID, but also I want to make sure that if you are asked to give an elevator speech about why bereavement and grief matter so much, that we're furnishing you with, with evidence that we think is pretty darn compelling about why it matters and why um, primary health care providers and school-based mental health clinics and, and practitioners in private practice who see bereaved uh, clients should be systematically screening for difficulties. So the particular title of today's presentation was inspired by an editorial that came out in the uh, in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, a few months ago, in which it warned that a second wave is building. And that is that we have rising rates in mental health and, and substance use disorders. Um, and the second wave is following the first wave, which of course is the wave of COVID-related deaths. And this imminent uh, mental health surge brings further challenges for individuals, families, and communities, including increased deaths from suicide and drug overdoses. And as in the first COVID wave, we are observing disproportion. Uh, it will disproportionately affect black and Hispanic individuals and older adults, lower SES groups of all races and ethnicities, and healthcare workers. And this interpersonal loss at a massive scale is compounded by societal disruption which it makes it more difficult for us to be able to grieve and mourn. So we have social distancing and quarantine measures that are implemented as mitigation strategies, but these amplify the emotional turmoil by substantially changing the social fabric by which individuals, families, communities, and nations cope with tragedy. And the effect is multidimensional disruption of employment, finances, education, healthcare, food security, et cetera. Many different systems have been adversely impacted. And they themselves are now assuming a life of their own, and they are exerting their own separate effects. Now, of central concern, once again, continuing with the editorial, of central concern is the transformation of normal grief and distress into prolonged grief and major depressive disorder and symptoms of PTSD. And once established, these conditions themselves can become chronic with additional comorbidities, such as substance use disorders. Now, something that I think is very sobering, is that the, uh, the amplifier, if you will, the multiplier for bereavement-related deaths is nine family members who are bereaved. So I checked yesterday, in the United States, we had approximately 433,000. Uh, in the United States, 2.2 million globally uh, who, have, uh, who have died uh, due to COVID or uh, partially contributed to by, by COVID. So if you do the math, that translates to 3.9 million family members across the, the, the United States and nearly 20 million family members globally. So these are enormous numbers um, that we're dealing with. Another concern is long-term unemployment, and that is that un unprecedented unemployment shocks amplified by lockdown will cause, are estimated to cause, nearly 900,000 deaths over the next 15 years. And a sobering statistic is that for every 10% increase in national employment, mortality tends to increase by 1.2%. Uh, and the authors of this study, 
report that unemployment and economic growth are essential components of a healthy society, and that that translates directly not only into mental health, but also into mortality rates. We also have an increase in what we're termed deaths of despair, and that, that is a death attributable to drug overdose and suicide and alcohol. And the pandemic and recessions uh, are associated with 10 to 60 percent increase in deaths of despair above already high pre-pandemic levels. And they're disproportionately experienced by working age men starting at the 15 to 24 age bracket. And the authors conclude that social isolation is part of the mechanism that turns a pandemic into a wave of deaths of despair. And more, more broadly, not just simply talking about COVID, but other types of epidemics as well. The suicide rate in 2017 was the highest in over 50 years and consistently ranks among the 10 leading causes of death over the, the past decade. It was so high that the director of the CDC wrote an editorial and talked about the fact that, that too many lives are being lost and too often and too early. And what happens when young people die, for example, due to drug overdose and suicide, is it really pulls down the national life expectancy. And self-harm is the 14th leading cause of death worldwide in 2016 and is predicted to rise at the 11th uh, leading cause of death by 2040. And overdose deaths have risen uh, dramatically over the last 18 years. If we're looking at, at epidemiological rates, nationally representative studies a bereaved adolescence report that uh, one, nearly 1.5, closer to 2% of youth report losing a biological mother, and around 4% report losing a biological father uh, cumulatively during their adolescence. And the childhood bereavement estimation model, which is coming out of Judy's house, estimates that one in 14 or 5.2 million children in the United States will experience the death of a parent or sibling before reaching the age of 18. And by age 25, this more than doubles to 13.2 million. And so the reality of this is that those of us who work in settings, uh, in healthcare settings, are likely going to routinely encounter children, adolescents, young adults, adults with histories of bereavement. And it's important not only to be able to identify bereavement, but, but to be able to identify the consequences of bereavement as well. So starting with adults, bereaved uh, spouses, parents, and siblings are at risk of premature death as a result of their loss. Bereaved parents who lose a child at any age are more likely to suffer from cardiac problems, cancer, psychiatric hospitalization, cognitive decline, and other health complications. And these effects persist statistically for an average of 18 years following the death. These are long shadows that are cast across the, the life course of bereaved people. I recently published with Julie Kaplow um, a, a large chapter that lays out principles of evidence-based assessment with children and adolescents. Uh, my particular area of expertise is in adolescents and young, young adults. And so we reviewed the literature on consequences of bereavement. And it's quite sobering compared to non-bereaved youth. Um, adolescents who lost a parent are at increased risk for many health adjustment problems. Lower self-esteem, reduced resilience, lower grades and more school failures, reduced likelihood of graduating any grade level through college, reduced professional income once you reach adulthood, heightened risk for depression and anxiety, suicide attempts, suicide, premature death due to any cause, illicit drug use, violent crime involvement, youth delinquency, and more and more severe psychiatric difficulties, including psychosis, and for girls' reluctance to marry and form stable families once they, they reach young adulthood, and mortality risk due to any cause. If you'd like to have uh, the chapter, you're welcome to access um, my website afterwards. I've got uh, a version of that posted if you'd like to have access to that literature review. Now, when I go over this, I think it's just the very first thing that we'd like to get across is that we want to have a caveat against fatalism and alarmism. These are sobering statistics, but the, the notion of increased risk refers to a statistical likelihood. Uh, it can be misleading because most bereaved youth do not develop serious adjustment difficulties, and that is a heartening message that we want to get across. Our best available estimates are that between 10 and 15% of bereaved individuals 
develop clinically significant difficulties, like difficulties in functioning, risky behavior, or developmental disruption. So in other words, 85 to 90 percent of bereaved youth are within an adaptive or normal range. And that's a pretty heartening statistic when we, uh, when we consider the risks that bereavement confers. So our grief assessment tools, and especially our theory and interventions and policies, should reflect this reality. And that is we want a strength-based approach because otherwise we're actually missing 85 to 90 percent of bereaved youth who could otherwise benefit from this. But the facts tell us that bereavement is a very difficult life experience to undergo, and that we should do all we can to lighten their load. And we want to talk about how we can do this. So let's talk about our second learning objective, and that is that grief is coming of age. Um, I would say honestly, uh, and I'm drawing on the, I'm drawing on some presentations that were given uh, at a professional conference and so forth. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not inaccurate to characterize the bereavement and grief field as sometimes, you know, 20 years behind that of PTSD. Just in terms of the types of studies and the sophistication of the studies, what is known about it, the number of people who are conducting types of research, et cetera. We're really hoping that we can accelerate that developmental progression. And there are a number of things that have happened that I consider to be very good news that help us to say that I, I think uh, bereavement may be sort of the new trauma in terms of the level of interest and support and the recognition that it's receiving, for example, on capital. And the first is federal recognition is a major public health issue. And the second is prolonged grief disorder in dsm 5 gm So very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail right here, but this is the very first time this year, uh, once it was signed in uh, into the, the, uh, the federal budget, NIMH health agencies are now required to outline how they're advancing bereavement and care. And so all these different agencies are now required to start to collect data and to report data to Congress about how they're serving bereaved families. This is a major step forward in bereavement and the needs of bereaved families and people uh, on the federal radar screen. And oftentimes that sometimes itself is a precursor to funding um, for researchers and, and for interventionists and so forth. And so this is a major uh, developmental milestone for our field, and we're very happy about that. Leading the charge is, uh, is in this area has been ever more foundation. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And the second is the, uh, the inclusion of prolonged grief disorder in DSM-5-TR. This is huge um, from our perspective. Previously, it was in the, uh, the appendix as persistent complex bereavement disorder. It was officially adopted in November 2020. It's awaiting posting to the APA website. Technically, as soon as it's posted to that, it is now an official disorder. Um, and it's scheduled to come out in printed form in the DSM-5 PR in May of this year. And so there's a certain degree, if you will, of, of uh, urgency uh, to the message that we have today about laying the foundation and making sure they're ready to actually work with this new disorder in ways that help us to maximize the likelihood of helping um, bereaved kids, families, and communities. Um, this is, once again, a message by uh, the committee to the APA advocating for prolonged grief disorder. It has long been recognized that there are bereaved individuals whose course seems so severe, sufficiently out of the ordinary range, and accompanied by severe impairment in daily functioning and the ability to move forward in life to raise deep concerns on the part of the family, friends, and clinicians. Recent research and clinical observation is suggesting that there is a relatively small subset of the bereaved who suffer bereavement-related symptoms in such a persistent, complex manner and with such significant impairment that warrants consideration of a bereavement-related disorder independent of other psychiatric conditions. And that petition was heard, and so it is now in the DS. And so um, I've received permission from, uh, from the chair of that committee to present uh, prolonged grief disorder reactions. And this is what they look like. Um, blue represent our developmental modifications, which are accepted and are either in the diagnostic criteria or they're going to be in the accompanying test. So the, the death at least 12 months ago of a person who was close to the bereaved individual for children and adolescents, at least six months, and we feel that's very important because kids uh, age quickly and, and developmental opportunities and disruptions can occur, uh, be lost and occur very quickly 
And second is, and second, yes, uh, is that since the death, the development of a persistent grief re response characterized by one or both of the following symptoms. I'm glad to say that this used to be one symptom and it was conflated and we talked them into breaking it into two, which makes it a lot easier to assess and explain to our clients. And the first is intense yearning and longing for the deceased person. So if they really pine, they really want to be reunited with that person, their heart is aching to be with them again, um, that captures that. And the second is preoccupation with thoughts or memories of the deceased person. So they keep on thinking of the person when they can't, and they can't get them out of their mind and so forth. Interestingly enough, for children and adolescents, this preoccupation may also include preoccupation over the circumstances of the death. Um, this is something that we felt very strongly about and we're very glad is there. Um, I'd like to emphasize something here about the structure of prolonged grief disorder. This is a lean, pared down, concise set of diagnostic criteria. I almost feel like they took out anything that could be possibly conflated with PTSD on one side or with depression, et cetera. Um, so it's very brief. Now, before I move on to the other criteria, I want to point out that B is separated from C because these two um, uh, diagnostic criteria in longitudinal studies have, have uh, taken the role of what we call gateway reactions. And that is, if activated, if they're severe and persisting, they tend to, to cascade forward into the broader complex of grief reactions. And those are the seasons. And so here they are. Since the death, at least three of the following symptoms have been present most days to a clinically significant degree. And these are identity disruption, feeling as though part of oneself has died, a marked sense of disbelief about the death, just can't get yourself to believe that they're really gone, avoidance of reminders that the person is, is dead. So these would be loss reminders. In children and adolescents, this may be characterized by efforts to avoid reminders. So in other words, in many cases, kids and adolescents don't have a choice. You know, if, if a parent wants to take them somewhere, for example, that serves as a reminder, it might be to a grave or it might be uh, to a, you know, a dad's place of work, whatever it is. In many cases, they want to, to avoid the reminder. They might try to, but they don't necessarily succeed in that. And that's important to keep in mind for children and adolescents. Four is intense emotional pain, um, anger, bitterness, and sorrow related to the death. Difficulty reintegrating into one's relationships and activities after the death. For me, this is tapping into functional impairment, but it nevertheless is a grief reaction in DSM-5, TR. Emotional numbness as a result of the death. Feeling that life is meaningless as a result of the death. And intense loneliness as a result of the death. And so those of you who are familiar with diagnostic criteria will say, this looks a lot more like say depression, for instance, than it does PTSD. It is not very multidimensional. There's only the partitioning of the B uh, gateway symptoms from the C. And so that has, I would argue, both advantages and disadvantages. The remaining criteria are the disturbances uh, causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social occupation or other areas of functioning. Um, e is challenging clearly exceeds expected social, cultural, or religious norms for the individual culture and context. The text for prolonged grief disorder is still being written, but we are happy to say that it's being written by a, a really very skilled cultural psychiatrist uh, by the name of Roberto um, Luis Fernandez. And F, the symptoms are not better explained by major depressive disorder, PTSD, or another mental disorder, were attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or another medical condition. So this sort of the standard uh, rule outs. So that itself is prolonged grief disorder. And as I said before, it's really quite simplified and pared down compared to persistent complex bereavement disorder. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but I'll just simply say as, as somebody who was invited by the American Psychiatric Association to provide evidence to their committee, I was surprised by the broad range of types of evidence that they asked for and how carefully they considered that evidence and frankly, how empirically driven they were. So everything from samples, are they clinical or popular, you know, community samples, endorsement rates, just simple endorsement rates, frequency counts, for example, 
of a brief item pool that we have of 80 plus items. Looking at individual symptom counts, uh, item means is very important. Dimensionality, reliability, validity, classification accuracy, and prevalence rates were all considered. And uh, you can uh, look at this in, in greater detail in the slides themselves. Now, one qualifier that I want to say is that not all of our recommendations were included in prolonged grief disorder. As I mentioned before, it's not multidimensional apart from the B versus uh, C. And we think that in some ways that is a loss. It's a loss of clinical richness, um, making things a lot more sort of condensed and I think sort of making grief itself look like a microcosm as opposed to a very broad uh, description of the, the broader complex of grief we have. And the second is there is no specific adjustment disorder for acute or short-term grief reactions, although you can, of course, ad uh, diagnose uh, adjustment disorder, especially if your clients are highly distressed and they haven't met that minimum six months for children and adolescents or 12 months for adults. So let's talk about learning objective number three, and that is creating bereavement-informed systems of care. And what do I actually mean by that? Well, the first is... is one of the things that's challenging about working with grief, once again, is that most bereaved kids do not develop clinically significant distress. And we have grief support facilities all over the country, literally thousands of them, that seek to help bereaved kids who are just simply maybe feeling lonely or would like to, to have some companionship. They'd like to, to do some fun activities, for example, that help them to be able to grieve. And so what we're proposing what I'm proposing here is to lay out the idea of continuity of bereavement-informed care that interdigitates, that, that, um, that connects together grief support facilities, for example, with grief treatment facilities and care providers. And if you look actually at the types of services that grief support facilities can provide, they can do, and in fact, they actually do as part of our, our gift network, our practice research network, We've got providers who do not have clinicians on staff. They don't provide clinical services, so, but they nevertheless provide risk screening, and they refer kids who score above a cutoff score on for in-depth clinical assessment. So referrals of those youth who test positive to grief uh, treatment facilities or providers, and, but they can provide grief support services. The aim is to facilitate adaptive grief reactions and positive adjustments as well as outcome evaluation at the individual case level um, and program evaluation at the broader uh, programmatic level, as well as public advocacy and outreach. And so they provide an enormously important um, service to the great majority of bereaved kids and families. And so how can we then interdigitate them with grief treatment facilities? Well, uh, if you're a frontline provider, for example, and you work in a school-based clinic or you work in a university hospital, you work uh, in private practice, you can uh, provide risk screening. You can refer youth who test negative to support grief support services. That is, once again, who test negative, who are not above uh, or don't fall within the clinical range. You can refer them on to grief support facilities. Oftentimes, these are cost-free, and they can then get a lot of help. But what we would argue is unique about this is that they can provide in-depth clinical assessment and, diagno and diagnosis, as well as therapeutic services. The aim is not only to facilitate adaptive grief reactions and positive adjustments, but to reduce maladaptive grief reactions. And so that is, if you will, the clinical and therapeutic service that we would argue that they, they're providing. And once again, we would say that that's probably appropriate on average uh, for about uh, 10 to 15 percent of, of bereaved people. They can also, of course, uh, conduct outcome evaluation, program evaluation, and public advocacy and, and outreach. So the two service systems together can start to stitch together and create continuity of bereavement informed care. We're now starting to make inroads with uh, pediatrics and general family practitioners and so forth. Having a grief disorder and risk screening tools is going to allow them to systematically screen not only for trauma, but for bereavement, for instance, and to once again take part in this broader um, bereavement-informed care uh, risk screening and referral network. So when we talk about uh, bereavement-informed care, what elements are we talking about in particular? 
I would argue that knowledge of prevalence estimates of bereavement and, and, and prolonged grief disorder, and that's going to be possible once again when we have assessment tools in your particular region and in your setting are, are very valuable to you. You can conduct risk screening and triage and referral to appropriate follow-up. If you have uh, you know, clinical skills, you can conduct in-depth clinical assessment, detailed information gathering, diagnosis as is appropriate, and assess for comorbid conditions like depression and PTSD. You can also uh, conduct assessment-driven case conceptualization and intervention planning using clear decision rules about, for example, what to prioritize if a client reports both prolonged grief disorder and PTSD symptoms. That's something that our treatment addresses. And as needed, modularized, flexibly driven intervention based on the client's or patient's assessment profile, informed preferences in, in your own professional judgment. So I'm going to talk a bit more about bereavement, and this is in my, my uh, own way of trying to uh, give you content for an elevator speech if you ever need to make a case about why bereavement itself is so important. One of the things that is so important, it's uh, for those of you who follow the adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs literature, loss is sometimes simply bundled in as another ACE, as another adverse uh, life experience. Um, we would argue that this should actually be unpacked because bereavement itself exerts its own uh, aftermath. ACEs in general don't, don't cause grief reactions. Uh, so I'm mean, looking at acute grief disorder. Um, there is no acute grief disorder uh, uh, diagnosis. That would be something that would be better covered by an adjustment disorder if it is something that falls uh, before the mandatory 12 versus 6 months follow-up. Uh, that's a question that just came up. So we had a large study that came out in 2014 that studied uh, an adult sample. This is close to 30,000 adults. Unexpected death of a loved one, that is accident, murder, suicide, heart attack, and terrorist attack, was the most commonly reported traumatic experience. Over 50% of respondents reported the unexpected death of a loved one. More respondents experience first unexpected death between the ages of 15 and 19 than any other age interval. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to systematically screen young people, including adolescents, because that is the age uh, range where they're first likely to experience an unexpected death. And most, uh, m more individuals rated uh, sudden death of a loved one as the worst lifetime experience than any other experience. Note that they are including things like sexual abuse, for example, abuse, psychological abuse, um, physical abuse, et cetera, and other types of accidents, et cetera. So this actually won out as the worst uh, lifetime experience. They also identified a dose-response relation between number of unexpected deaths and number of lifetime psychiatric disorders. There was an increased risk after unexpected death at nearly every point across the life course, that is, they partitioned across developmental periods or epochs, and they found that the likelihood uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder, major de uh, depressive disorder, and panic dis disorder all increased as a linear function uh, of exposure to uh, unexpected death. So this is our way of passing the so wet test, not only for adolescents and children, but for adults. Another thing to keep in mind about grief, and one of the reasons why we try to unpack bereavement and mourning from grief, is that they're very different entities and they should not be conflated. Grief itself, we would argue, is a key mediator between bereavement, which is a life experience, and adjustment. So why do we want to distinguish between bereavement and grief? Well, studying and assessing and conceptualizing and treating bereavement without grief reactions is like studying, assessing, conceptualizing, and treating trauma without PTSD. So you're really missing the missing link um, if you don't assess grief reactions uh, as well as bereavement. And the thing that is really quite striking about the studies that I've cited thus far is they're simply assessing bereavement. They're not including grief. And if you want to think about just simply what the research literature would look like if you only assess trauma exposure without including PTSD, well, PTSD itself is a powerful predictor above and beyond trauma exposure 
for many different types of adverse outcomes. And that is also our expectation. That is what we're starting to find as we conduct studies of, of uh, bereavement and grief, is that it adds incrementally to the prediction of many types of adverse outcomes. So screening for stress-related disorders like grief and PTSD, it's a double barrel challenge. And I, forgive me, I, I, I'm a strong believer in assessment, and so I'm going to go into a little bit of detail right here. Dual, it's a dual challenge for assessing causes and effects. It centers on the need to accurately assess both sides of a cause and effect equation. Exposure to the stressful life events themselves on one hand and their causal consequences on the other. And assessment errors can arise on both sides of the equation, resulting in both underdetection of exposures, that is bereavement, on one hand, and underdiagnosis of their effects on the other hand. Now, let me give you one example. Um, from the PTSD literature that is as close uh, as I can find to what we're, we're getting at here in Berlin. Uh, Claude Kemto evaluated, and his team evaluated the accuracy of clinicians working in the community mental health clinics in identifying trauma exposure and PTSD in 157 children. The children and the parents were assessed twice, first by a clinical practitioner used standard intake assessment and their standard training, and the second by a, a study clinician was specifically trained for assessment and who used a structured trauma-focused assessment instrument. That is something that was much more systematic. And although those clinicians were, were mandated to assess trauma exposure, they identified less than half of youth identified by the trained study clinicians as having trauma exposure. And that is 21% versus 51%. So they, they identified, they missed more than half of the trauma exposure. And they also uh, identified PTSD in 1.9% of the fam of the sample, where, whereas study clinicians reported it in 19.1%. In other words, they missed 90% of the cases of PTSD. This is very, very sobering. So although clinic practitioners had access to the assessment results in each cl client's charts and updated their treatment plans on a quarterly basis, a follow-up review identified no changes in the client's PTSD diagnosis. It's like you come up with a diagnosis, you know, you, you have to do something for, for billing and reporting purposes, et cetera. And sort of that seems like that was what clinicians thought that they needed to do. And we're arguing that actually assessment tools are very, very valuable for uh, case conceptualization, for treatment planning, uh, for evaluating treatment outcome, et cetera. And so we're encouraging you to really move in the direction of systematic screening and assessment in part so we don't miss so many of our, of our young people. Um, interestingly enough, the clinicians identified emotional and behavioral problems and lower functioning, et cetera. So they saw the indicators, but missed the diagnosis. So what have we learned about assessing grief and bereaved children and adolescents? Once again, I, I want to emphasize this oftentimes because children and adolescents sometimes get the short end of the stick because a lot of the active research is being conducted in the adult literature. And I would say that's where the, the literature is most advanced. So grief itself shows a multidimensional structure. And that's what we advocated for when we talked with the APA. Grief is linked to impaired functioning with family, peers, and school. There's growing evidence of test validity for assessing maladaptive grief and that you can assess kids and adolescents directly using appropriately designed tools. Refocused intervention is linked to significant improvements in symptoms and in school function. Children can be good self-reporters under certain conditions, and that is, once again, with properly trained clinicians and with uh, developmentally appropriate assessment tools. And it is critically important to have developmentally appropriate wording, uh, and there should be developmental vetting of any assessment items with experienced clinicians and iterative refinement. Um, what we found is uh, we oftentimes had to iterate items multiple times. We called it going for that bewildered look where young kids, when we read the item, sometimes they'll look at you and they're mystified because they, it's an adult item and it doesn't make sense to them. Like, I've had difficulty uh, adjusting to the death of my dad. And that's a difficult question to ask an eight or a nine or a ten year old. That kind of self-reflective uh, capacity oftentimes is not something they're, they're really uh, is native to them. Um, but when you sit down with them and say, this is what we're trying to get at. 
You know, it's it's harder it's harder to get up in the morning. It's harder to be able to function. Oftentimes, the kids themselves would give us those items, and what we found is um, the kids would give us kind of a mystified look, and that's when you sort of know you got the item right because the, the mystified look is, how did you know that about me? That's part of my internal grieving experience, and I've not shared that with anybody. How did you know that about me? And that's oftentimes when we say, okay, we reach saturation. That item is a good item. We can move on. So why prioritize bereavement care? We would argue that developmental tasks and transitions are susceptible to developmental disruptions. One of the reasons why we think it's so important to be able to diagnose prolonged grief disorder, say six months as opposed to 12 months or longer after uh, the death of a loved one, is just simply because there, there are such opportunities for developmental disruption. It can, be, uh, it can have an enormous influence over kids, for instance, if they fail out of a grade. Uh, so a longitudinal study of long-term alterations in life achievements and developmental trajectories in 373,000 bereaved Norwegian youth. This is what happens when you have national health registries. You can do countrywide um, studies. Found that youth bereaved by parental death due to external causes, accidents, suicides, and homicides, were significantly less likely to complete all educational levels. These effects were most pronounced for completing high school and university college. So in other words, Adolescents and young adults are at the highest uh, risk for bereavement-related developmental disruptions in education in that domain. And girls were also more reluctant to marry once they came of age. So we have long-term developmental impacts. And once again, this is just simply assessing bereavement, not grief reactions. I would uh, expect that they would get more variants explained and have more rich findings if they included grief. School impairment can have long-term developmental impacts. In a large nationally representative study, this is something that we published several years ago with Ben Oosterhoff, who's the lead author. Over 10,000 young people, a nationally representative sample of youth, uh, reported, found that sudden loss, accidents, murder, suicide, and heart attack, was the most frequently endorsed of a uh, type of severe life event of 18 type study, the most frequent, likely to, to occur in mid-adolescence, 15 and 16 years of age, and it's inversely linked to all five indicators of impaired school functioning that are studied. Once again, this is self-reported, but they're reporting lower academic achievement, concentration, and ability to learn, less enjoyment of school, lower school belongingness or a sense of bonding or social attachment to the school, and lower beliefs that treat teachers treat would be a failure. They had a higher likelihood of actually thinking that the teachers had it out for them and a drop in grades during a junior or senior high school year can significantly diminish and impede post-high high school educational opportunities. So even if you're not dropping out of school, uh, we would argue actually dropping out of school is a dramatic example of a developmental disruption. We're also concerned about students who would otherwise be A and B students, or are now C and D students, whose opportunities for admission, for example, in a competitive college, university, is diminished as a result of, of a bereavement experience and insufficient uh, support. So why do we prioritize bereavement care? We recently published a study that found that maladaptive grief reactions predicted suicide ideation via thwarted belongingness. And that is a, a predictor of adolescent suicidal uh, ideation and behavior in 58 bereaved youth. In other words, grief reactions mediated the relation between bereavement and suicide risk. So bottom line is you can't change bereavement. We can't bring loved ones back from the death. So we don't treat bereavement, but we can treat grief. And we can also sometimes directly work on that adverse outcome. For example, a kid might have lower academic functioning and we can get them tutoring, for instance. But we would argue also that sometimes the grief itself is an important target because as a key mediator, it continues to relay the effects of that bereavement over time. So why should we prioritize bereavement care? Implications for the finding that grief reactions mediate this link are the ability to, to detect uh, maladaptive grief reactions is a valuable therapeutic tool for early identification and intervention among bereaved adolescents. 
a high-risk group for whom a link between loss and suicidal ideation behavior is well established in the literature. This underscores the importance of early risk detection, assessment and diagnosis, and intervention in the aftermath of the death. It also underscores the importance of being trained in acute suicide prevention skills to intervene with individuals who report suicide ideation. And I, I'll have more to say about this later, but let me, let me say this now. My colleagues and I did a lot of work in the aftermath of 9-11, and we heard many, many stories in consultation calls where we trained them in our intervention, and then we held consultation calls afterwards. One of the complaints that we heard was um, a, 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 a young, uh, I think she was in her early 20s, a young woman whose brother had been killed. Um, he was a banker, and he, he died in the 9-11 in the, uh, the attacks. And when a therapist sat down with her and talked with her about her reactions, she did mention that she had fantasies of, of dying. And immediately, the clinician launched into a suicide prevention program, but failed to take advantage of the opportunity to say, this tells me how much you wish you had your brother back, or that you could be with your brother. And sometimes just simply framing these types of, of uh, suicidal ideation uh, within a bereavement context can bring an, uh, a powerful emotional response. It can help to normalize and validate these types of reactions because about 70 or 80 percent of the young people we've talked to believe in an afterlife. And if they believe about reuniting with, with uh, the deceased person, it does not necessarily mean that they have active suicide ideation. And that's just a really important uh, point to me. If you are focused on health disparities, then bereavement is an enormously important area to focus on. Differences in rates of exposure to sudden unexpected death contribute to health and mental health disparities that extend across the lifespan. So we already have disparities observed among youth in juvenile justice. There's a real risk of misdiagnosis and mischaracterization of behavior and potential overuse of psychotropic medications if you are not screening for bereavement, which is very high in the youth camps here in Los Angeles that we've worked in. Exposure to sudden death and associated grief reactions were disproportionately higher in a sample of JJ-involved youth in a mass sample of high school youth. And we, that was a, conduct, a study we conducted 20 years ago. And racial disparities in bereavement emerge early in life. They persist across the lifespan. After accounting for loss-related disparities, the health disparities gap between black and white Americans nearly disappears. And I just think this is enormous. I'm going to encourage you to look up this study. This is by Deborah Umberson, 2017. The paper is called Black Deaths Matter. And many health, uh, she's a sociologist, many health re researchers uh, for decades have been trying to understand and explain why it is that black Americans and families tend to, to not live as long as other racial groups. And this is called the, the health disparities gap. Interestingly enough, when she introduced bereavement, not grief, but bereavement alone, that health disparities gap virtually closed. That is an enormously powerful explanatory variable. So what are the implications of these bereavement-related health disparities? Addressing disparities in bereavement can help to address major disparities affecting minority and underserved groups, while also reducing the risk for underdetection, misdiagnosis, developmental disruption, and inappropriate treatment. And timely detection and intervention will help to create a window of opportunity for timely remediation of developmental disruptions of bereaved youth, young people who are at serious risk for school dropout and entry into the juvenile justice system. So, in summary, why should we prioritize bereavement care? We need to identify bereaved individuals and families and offer timely intervention in the form of promoting adaptive grieving and positive adjustments and as many as, as are interested in receiving services. We want to reduce severe distress, and that's the more clinical or therapeutic aspects of our work. We want to improve functioning at school, home, with peers, and in communities. We want to reduce risky behavior, for example, health risk behavior, suicide ideation, et cetera. 
as well as reduce developmental disruptions and make timely developmental course corrections. So, for example, salvaging a school year instead of allowing a, a, a young person, for example, to be held back a year. So returning to this notion of creating bereavement-informed systems and creating con continuity of bereavement-informed care, we can start to think about this actually as a social safety net where we have, for example, grief support facilities and outreach, for example, in schools or in, in the communities. For example, here in West Los Angeles, we have um, our house. Um, remember, they have Judy House, et cetera. But they have many different grief support facilities in large cities and oftentimes in many uh, small cities, et cetera. And they provide a very valuable service for the great majority of bereaved youth and families. But we also want to start working to connect them with clinical service providers who can provide clinical services, including in-depth clinical assessment, diagnosis, and therapeutic service uh, services for clinically significant distress and uh, other behavioral types of problems that we see. So how do we, why do we need a theory of grief that explicitly address both adaptive good grief and maladaptive grief reactions? This is what I've been working on for the last 20 years since having Nadesa sit me down and tell me that I was missing something very important. Something that is very important to keep in mind when we're trying to do risk screening or assessment or just simply just carefully observing our clients and trying to figure out whether they need specialized help is something that we call the Charlie Brown problem. And that is good grief. There is such a thing as good grief. Adaptive grief is not studied nearly as much as maladaptive grief, which is a major shortcoming in the literature. However, good grief is the norm, as we said before, about 85 to 90 percent of kids and adults um, uh, fall within, if you will, the normal and adaptive range. The Shared Grief Project highlights important examples of good grief, and I'm going to give you a, a resource to that. Uh, but the Shared Grief Project, if you want to make a quick note, was developed by Todd Arkey who lost his father in his early teens. And he goes around and he interviews all sorts of sports stars and hip-hop artists and actors and so forth and talks with them about what it was like for them to grow up uh, without a mother, for example, or a father. All these people have lost a parent when they were young. And these are some really inspiring stories about how to, uh, how to grieve it's a, it's a very empowering message because it says that even though you can have a devastating loss like this, you can still have a good life. You can have a very successful life uh, in a variety of different benchmarks. So grief differs from depression, from schizophrenia, from manic depressive disorder and tick disorder, et cetera. We don't say there's a good depression. We don't say there's a good schizophrenia and that it's our job to differentiate between adaptive and maladaptive schizophrenia. We don't say the same thing for manic depressive disorder, et cetera. Um, the closest relative, I would say, for grief is anxiety, and that is you actually want to be aroused to a certain uh, level. I mean, look at any football coach, for example, before a game and watch them try to rally the troop. You know, uh, they want to get people aroused. And so in that sense, we can have sort of optimal levels of arousal, and we can also be grieving within an adaptive range. But it really does place a lot of responsibility of, uh, on us as clinicians. Having a clinical disorder places a lot of responsibility on us to make sure that we're not over-pathologizing grief um, and making sure that we're using properly developed instruments and we've got a good working theory that helps us to be able to identify more adaptive uh, reactions to grief. So if we compare trauma exposure and PTSD with bereavement, you don't you don't say that you have adaptive PTSD. In general, PTSD is something we want to go down. Uh, the closest that I can say to PT adaptive PTSD is when I was working over in Bosnia. If kids are living in a war zone, we're exposing them, progressive systematic re relaxation, for example, is going to make them less reactive to reminders and to dangerous situations. We may not want to really treat that PTSD very, very much because it's actually helping to keep them alive. But once the danger is passed, then this is something that is not very helpful because it interferes with all sorts of tasks like doing well in school and forming romantic relationships. Bereavement, on the other hand, has an adaptive outcome. And that's something that we actually want to actively facilitate 
cultivate, encourage, as well as maladaptive reactions. And that is what we're trying to do here. So how can multidimensional grief theory address both adaptive grieving and therapeutic intervention for maladaptive grief? So in speaking with our, 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 uh, our chair of the APA committee that reviewed public commentary, we had a six-week window where anyone could, could log in their comments about proposed diagnostic criteria for prolonged grief disorder. And they got almost 50 single-spaced pages of commentary. A great deal uh, of concerns and some encouragement were, were, uh, were left. So if we try to do kind of a thematic uh, distilling down of some of these concerns, this is tapping into some of those. This is not a systematic, uh, rigorous study. But these are types of themes that, that emerge in our discussions with the APA. Adopting a medical model that emphasizes pathology and dysfunction rather than wellness and positive adjustment. It's not strength-based. Pathologizing grief reactions per se and talking about them as symptoms. Um, I, I actually avoid talking about symptoms. I talk about grief reactions. Impacting young people's self-concept. I have a disorder. Where social stigma could be a barrier and make people reluctant to seek help. Overdiagnosis of normal grief reactions or bias, selective attention to only some of a wide range of grief reactions and failing to validate normal and adaptive grief reactions. So really focusing on the negative and neglecting the broad range of grief reactions. And risk for uh, missing important differences linked to culture, development, gender, race, ethnicity, relationships of the deceased, circumstances of the death, et cetera. There's so many contextual variables that, that play a role in being able to, to assess and conceptualize and work with grieving kids. So let me propose there's three solutions, general solutions to these criticisms. First is to create a developmentally informed diagnosis that is sensitive to and reflective of the ways in which children and adolescents actually experience and manifest maladaptive grief reactions. And that is something that we work hard to do. Um, we're reasonably pleased with what, what is there. Create well-constructed assessment tools that are brief, reliable, valid, and carry minimal risk of stigma and are clinically actionable. That is, they tell you what to do. If you're, if you're trained in their use, you know what to do given a given test score. And three is they help you to create a strength-based theory of grief that affirms the adaptive functions of grief, that assists in differentiating between adaptive versus maladaptive grief, that describes and explains the nature of individuals' distress and, fun and difficulties, and in other words, gives them words that help them to describe and understand their experience, and prescribes interventions to reduce distress, and improve functioning. So how do we do that? So an overview of multidimensional grief theory, once again, this is something that I've been working on since the late 1990s. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge many people have inspired this. Uh, Robert Pinus, uh, Edward Ryanierson uh, has inspired this work, uh, Kathy Shear, Holly Priggerson, Catherine uh, Madeer, uh, and, and Julie Caplow. Uh, many other people have, have uh, contributed uh, to this work, and I'd like to acknowledge them. This is what the basic model looks like. And there are sort of two things to keep in mind. It's two-dimensional right here. We've got adaptive versus maladaptive at the bottom, and that is we've got three different domains, separation distress, existential or identity-related distress, and circumstance-related distress, three primary domains in which people can grieve. And second of all is within each of those domains, we can distinguish between more adaptive and helpful responses versus maladaptive and unhelpful responses. And what I propose is that each of these domains has a central coping challenge. And if you want to think about it this way, this is sort of agnostic. It's not necessarily a good thing or it's a bad thing, but this is the, the, the crux of that challenge. And how they cope with it is, uh, helps them determine what their grief profile looks like and whether they would fall within the more adaptive and helpful versus maladaptive or unhelpful uh, end of things. How can I continue to feel connected to the person who died so that they remain an important part of my life? That's the challenge. If they're able to feel a sense of connection and move forward with their lives, we would say that that reflects adaptive and helpful ways of responding to that challenge. 
But sometimes, for example, it might be taking on the bad habits of the person who died, for instance, or uh, um, taking on their roles, for example, a, a dangerous member of a gang, for instance, or other types of, of, of uh, roles that were, that were um, not constructive uh, to society, for example, or in your, in your own family or community. The challenge of existential and identity related distress is, who am I as a person? That's identity. And what is the purpose of my existence? That's the existential. Now that this loved one is physically absent from my life. So, adaptive and helpful elements of this would be, you have a, a clear sense of who you are as a person. You don't feel like the best part of you died, for example, or that you stopped living. Uh, those of you who ever watch, um, the Princess Bride find that there's a certain part of the movie when she says, I died that day, when she's talking about the loss of her love. That would actually be um, an identity-related challenge right there. You feel a loss of your own personal identity. Um, and once again, there are adaptive versus less adaptive ways of being able to respond to this. Um, some young people honestly may say things, and I've heard them say this in my own work with them, and say, I've lost what matters most to me, so nothing else matters. It does not take a traumatic death for someone to have an existential crisis and really feel that the primary purpose for you to, uh, you know, to, to move forward and, and live and make plans for the future died with the person who died or feel terribly diminished as a person. You don't feel the same way that you did before the person died. You're now somebody, you don't feel like yourself anymore. Um, those are different ways of, of uh, reflecting an identity-related crisis. And there are ways in which people can respond to that um, in more adaptive versus less adaptive ways. And the third is the challenge of circumstance-related distress, and that is how do I manage my distressing thoughts, beliefs, wishes, fantasies, emotions, and impulses evoked by how this person died. A very important thing to keep in mind here is that it does not take a traumatic death for people to have a lot of distress over how the person died. They may feel, for example, that the person died alone. The person died unnecessarily. You might have a grandparent, for example, in, a, you know, in, a, in an elderly care facility, and that facility was required to take in COVID positive or at least COVID untested patients, and your grandparent may have died. So it does not take necessarily a traumatic death, but it takes disturbing deaths, if you will, and tragic deaths for uh, people to have these types of reactions. In our own data set, we find, for example, that circumstance-related distress tends to be higher in, for example, Detroit than it is in Ann Arbor or other cities uh, you know, that, are, that are smaller in size. Would anyone in, in, uh, in their comments like to, to propose uh, a hypothesis about why that's the case? Why would Detroit have higher levels of circumstance-related distress compared to smaller towns? What we're finding is that there are much higher murder rates, if you will, homicides, suicides, and so forth. Yes, and somebody's saying gang affiliation, et cetera. Um, one thing that I did not speak about in detail right here is that a lot of the metrics that are so deeply con uh, concerning, uh, including murder rates, are going up in the aftermath of COVID. And we would hypothesize that that is going to drive up circumstance-related stress. In other words, it's just simply harder to, um, to grieve a person who has died. Okay, can we turn off the poll? I'm having a hard time, Abby, with advancing my speech. Did you, uh, did you turn it off? Give me one second. Yeah. All right. So why Abby is, is doing this, okay. All right. Thank you. 
So while while uh, Abby is doing this, I just want to emphasize this is a, a topic of active debate at the APA um, retreat. Is 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 distress evoked by the circumstances of the death necessarily PTSD or acute stress disorder? And we would argue very strongly that the answer is no. People can die in distressing ways. You can die, for example, of cancer and you know, suffer a progressive uh, wasting illness. And that could be very, very upsetting for family members to observe. But does it qualify as a criterion A uh, traumatic experience for PTSD? Typically not. So there are many different types of deaths that may have disturbing elements to them that we would say fall within the, 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 the rubric a multidimensional grief theory that you cannot adequately explain using PTSD or grief, uh, acute grief disorder as, as a diagnostic construct. You, you, uh, you can't adequately explain that. Now, one of the other rich features of this theory is that it makes room for a number of different types of, of sources of distress. So separation distress, for example, a primary driver of that are disturbances in attachment relations, and that is you feel disattached from someone you're very attached to. The problem here is that the person died. Existential and identity-related distress, it is a crisis of meaning. Either the meaning of your life or who you are as a person and your own sense of selfhood and the continuity of your selfhood before and after a, a devastating loss. The problem here, once again, is that the person died. It does not take a traumatic death or a highly tragic death uh, to evoke an existential or identity-related uh, crisis. Someone can die a peaceful death at age 95 and still leave uh, loved ones who have a lot of existential and identity-related distress. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. And the third is circumstance-related distress. Here, it's the manner of death. It's how the person died. These are tragic, traumatic, and deeply disturbing deaths. So there's room in here for attachment-related disturbances, meaning-making disturbances, and manner of death, if you will, related disturbances. So there's a lot of context here and a lot of room for, for therapeutic maneuvering. And multidimensional grief theory itself lays out a, a number of sort of core propositions right here. And that is both maladaptive and positive adjustment can manifest within each domain. Positive and negative adjustment processes can and frequently do co-occur within a given domain. It is not realistic. I have never seen a data set where adaptive and maladaptive grief are not correlated or are inversely correlated. They're usually correlated around 0.6 or so, but usually not very, very highly, which is a good thing. But it is very common for people to have both adaptive and maladaptive reactions to a death. What we want to do as interventionists is to increase the rate of adaptive reactions and decrease and allow the, the maladaptive, the highly distressing and troubled responses to recede over time. And the extent to which a given youth engages in specific grief responses, both adaptive and maladaptive, within each domain and across the domain makes up their individual grief profile. And so this is one of the reasons why we emphasize that it's, it's valuable to have assessment uh, tools that allow you to build that assessment profile. So that helps you to build your case conceptualization and your intervention plan. Are you having any? Yeah, I was having some problems. Okay. okay. A multidimensional framework is important. What are the, the, the implications for intervention and for therapeutic clinical work? Different dimensions of grief may be more prominent at different developmental stages, what we are actually finding in our GIFT network data set is that separation distress tends to be more prominent in children, whereas existential identity-related distress tends to be more prominent in adolescents, which maps on, if you will, onto their developmental tasks. Adolescents with becoming their own person and mapping out their sense of future, et cetera. So you may observe more of that existential uh, crisis uh, in an adolescent who is facing uh, the, the developmental task of forming uh, aspirations for their future and developing life plans and starting to work uh, towards those life plans. They may uh, differentially relate to different risk and protective factors.
the manner of death, the exposure to death, and the relationship to the deceased, exposure to reminders. What we find is that loss reminder exposure is strongly related to separation distress. Trauma reminder exposure, if the death itself was traumatogenic, had traumatic elements in it, those trauma reminders tend to be strongly related to circumstance-related distress, not surprisingly. Different dimensions of grief may be more prominent in some groups than in others. Type of death or culture, uh, SES. It may differentially relate to different correlates and consequences. Now, this is very important, for instance, if we've got a number of different types of reactions. Which do we focus on first? If some are more strongly related, for example, uh, like an existential crisis to suicide ideation, then that's something very important in terms of prioritizing which particular types of grief reactions you want to work on first. Hopelessness, desires for revenge, very common among kids who have circumstance-related distress in my work. Risky behavior, you find that um, in a lot of kids with existential-related distress and so forth, where they just don't care what happens to them. Pro-social activity, you find in kids who are grieving on the adaptive end of, of this game. And that is a real joy as an interventionist to work with kids who are grieving in adaptive ways. They do all sorts of really wonderful things. Advocating, coming into classrooms and demonstrating to their class, to, to, to their, uh, to their classmates certain types of skills, et cetera, teaching skills to their family members and friends, et cetera. There are lots of different ways in which youth can, can uh, grieve in adaptive ways. Over in Boston, we had kids get on the local radio station and speak to the town council about the needs of kids who've been severely traumatized and bullied. It can produce different grief profiles that supports individually tailored intervention, and it calls for different treatment components and supportive interventions. I, I highlight that because that I would argue that is very, very important. You don't focus a lot of circumstances of the death if a person died a peaceful death, but a person may have a lot of separation distress, may have a lot of existential or identity-related distress. And so, frankly, you may go down a rabbit hole that's simply not constructive if you don't have a multidimensional formulation. So I'm going to be a little bit more silly right now, but this, this, if you will, go with me on this. When theories of therapeutic change go awry, um, I'm saying this because I'm actually not a big fan of donuts, so I've decided to make donuts uh, the scapegoat. Donuts are bad for you. They, they spike your blood pressure, sugar. These spikes can lead to metabolic syndrome and over time to diabetes. Donuts are like a drug. You feel good for a short time, but then crash. So whatever you do, don't think about donuts. They are off limits. Just say no to donuts. In fact, think about anything but donuts. There you go again. Don't, did I just tell you not to think about donuts? The problem is when we keep on focusing on the negative. If we just talk about donuts and we don't talk about things that people should be doing, it's really not a very effective strategy for people to exchange one maladaptive behavior for a more adaptive one. So let's take a good lesson from dietitians galore and all your, your health trainers and personal trainers, et cetera. You don't just say, don't eat this. You say, eat a lot more of that. So you have to have a direction in which to steer people. And so some of the very best things you can do is to give people a recipe book and say, this is a life change. Let's focus on things that you can do that are going to, that are going to help you to build up your body. We want to take this same basic lesson uh, taken from you know, behavior change theory and apply it now to grief support and treatment work. And that is we want adaptive and helpful grieving to proceed. And we want the maladaptive or unhelpful grief reactions to recede. And so I want you to think about that in the same way that we think about the donut versus all the healthy food, et cetera, is that we want to be able to steer people away from, if you will, fixation on how the person died and wanting retaliation, for example, or feeling like life is really not worth living anymore, and having an existential crisis. We want to steer them towards a better alternative, something that seems actionable, that's realistic, and that's going to help them to feel better. And so this is one of the, the reasons why having an explicit place in the theory is giving you a lot more options, I would argue, for how to steer kids towards positive grieving. So what can we do? Having a flexible model of grief helps. It gives us a lot of flexibility in how to intervene. You can focus directly on reducing maladaptive grieving. There may be some things, for example, talking about how the person died and questions you have about that, 
for meaning making activities, for example, for reminiscing and remembering and finding ways to, to feel connected to the person as you move forward with your life. You may focus on that, but you can also focus on promoting adaptive grieving. And there are lots of different ways in which you can focus on, on that as well. Is um, particularly with respect to circumstance related distress, getting kids to come up with a positive reaction to how a loved one died is oftentimes very healing for them, as opposed to remaining fixated on how a loved one died, for instance, and having so many questions of being so angry that with themselves, for example, or others, and feeling like enough was not done to help their, their loved one. They might be angry at their loved one, for example, for not taking better care of themselves, etc. You can contrast between maladaptive and adaptive grieving and help your clients consider different ways of grieving and the way the trade-off and redirect them from maladaptive to, to adaptive grieving. Okay, so how can, mal how can multidimensional grief theory help us to understand traumatic and tragic deaths uh, associated with COVID? Catherine Shear, who's a very prominent adult grief researcher, says this. This pandemic is already associated with tremendous loss of lives worldwide. There are many aspects of COVID-19 that will increase the risk of grief derailers. Availability of effective grief therapy is more important than ever. We can also invoke the notion of disenfranchised grief, for example. The relationship is not recognized. The loss is not recognized. The griever is not recognized. The circumstance of the death or loss is, is stigmatized and grieving and coping style is unacceptable. Um, so there are many different ways in which death can occur that just simply make people feel like they are not able to access so many of the healing, mourning, and grieving rituals that make the uh, surviving the death of a loved one tolerable, including opportunities to get together in person and to exchange support. We can think about memorial services, for example, or funerals as literally a, a community quilting bee where everybody brings fragments of, of their memories of the person and they, they stitch it together and create a communal memory. Um, and for example, my mother died in 2009. I learned lovely things about my mother at an open mic session we had at, at her funeral dinner where I learned about lots of acts of kindness that my mom had performed. I didn't even know about it. These are oftentimes the types of uh, healing rituals that COVID and other types of uh, difficult deaths can interfere with in ways that make it much more difficult to grieve in comforting ways. With respect to risk factors, we can think of personnel, uh, risk factors, the deceased, relationship to the deceased, closeness, centrality of the relationship, the dependency, refacilitation with children. Grief, uh, grieving is facilitated by, by caregivers, and it is very important to be able to check in and assess caregivers to make sure that they actually are themselves grieving uh, in an adaptive way and that they can facilitate their own children's grieving. And circumstances of the death itself can make it much more distressing. There are also contextual factors. How well are their needs being met? And our current stressors already uh, sucking up their bandwidth, consequences of the loss, of the deprivations, instability, and insecurity, et cetera. I'd also like to talk about trauma reminders. These are reminders of the distressing manner of the death, smell places and people, and exposure to loss reminders. These are reminders of the ongoing loss and deprivation, like the person's name, a place that they used to be, their photos, belongings, and times when I need their support. So you can have a dynamic arise, for example, between brief reactions and PTSD reactions, where grief reactions make it more difficult to treat and to manage PTSD reactions. And PTSD reactions can make it more difficult to manage grief reactions. Some of the most important studies that have been done in this area indicate that young people who have both grief reactions and PTSD reactions are at risk for a more severe and persisting course. In other words, both sets of reactions tend to, to be uh, more persisting and to have an elevated course over time. All right. I'm going to move on, and I'm going to leave these uh, for you in the slides. So let's talk about trauma reminders and loss reminders. These are very important. 
Trauma reminders are things that are linked to the particular manner of death. And if the death itself was, was traumatic, then these become all the more important to attend to because these become very powerful evokers of ongoing distress, in especially circumstance-related distress. So these are linked to sights, sounds, smells, places, etc. Some of the most important trauma reminders we're finding are family members. People who were there at the time, for example. People who told you that a loved one had been killed, for instance, can be very powerful reminders. Or the reactions of your mother, for instance. She may be upset now, but that reminds you of the time when your brother uh, took his life by, uh, you know, took his own life. And you remember what her face looked like, and that itself can be a powerful reminder. Loss reminders are reminders of beloved people or places and belongings that you have lost, and they're present and future focused. So their name, belongings, places they used to be, people who look like them or used to be with them, things you used to do together, and times when you want their company or support. These themselves tend to be more potent, uh, uh, potent uh, evokers of grief reactions and especially separation districts. It's important also to keep in mind developmental disruptions. I'd like to lay out nine types of developmental impact to keep in mind, and this is taken from our treatment manual. You can have an interruption of age-appropriate developmental tasks, so there's a standstill. They just simply don't work on something, for instance. They might stop dating, for instance, or they might stop uh, you know, uh, actively preparing uh, for, the, for their future in some way. Developmental slowdowns or, or regressions I'm sorry, development will slow down to a slower rate of progression, and development regression is really the loss of competencies. You might have the delayed initiation of age-appropriate developmental tasks. So, for example, you might have, and if you remember we said, um, especially girls who've lost a parent um, to sudden loss tend not to uh, get married when they come of age. So you might have instances where someone lost a loved one at a younger age group, Age, and then kind of ages into an activity that, that then becomes developmentally age appropriate, and they may just simply be reluctant to do it. Another example is they might not want to drive, for example. They might not want to date. Um, they might want to uh, go out and get a job, for example, for the summer, or move out of the house. You can have pre precocious uh, developmental accelerations, like running away, or precocious sexual activity. You can have lost developmental opportunities for growth and fulfillment. So you might have kids, for example, who feel like they've got to go out and work to support the family. Instead of staying in after school sports, for example, or music, or music or, or theater, you can have what we call odysseys, and that is just taking lengthy times off from developmental tasks, like running away, um, as well as increased susceptibility to illness, and that's what we call allostatic load. They're just simply a, a, a greater sense of wear and tear on, on people's bodies. Um, they tend to, to be slower, more susceptible to illness, and they're just simply less productive. So here, let's talk about some practical things that you can do to prepare for prolonged grief disorder and raise the standard of bereavement care on a local level. And there are 15 things here. And these are questions. I'm turning this in kind of a, a checklist here. Do we screen for trauma and bereavement histories in our patients or clients? Second is, what are the prevalence rates for bereavement among our clients or our uh, patients? Are they in our top 10 of the problems we see? Do we know how to access data about our region? And you can use, for example, the Child Bereavement Estimation Model or CDC regional data to find out what bereavement rates look like, death rates look like uh, in your area. How do our assessment tools line up with what we're seeing clinically? Does our assessment battery cover what we see? This might seem obvious, but it's actually a, a really important question to ask yourself. Once you start to actually keep active records of the types of problems that you're seeing, Sit back every now and then and take a careful look to see at your assessment battery and whether you have adequate coverage. If you remember, uh, the clinicians in that particular sort of study, they missed half of the trauma exposure and 90% of the PTSD. If you're not screening for bereavement, it's highly unlikely you're ever going to pick up PGD. In the same sense, if you're not screening for trauma, it's highly unlikely you're going to pick, pick up PTSD. You've got to get the exposure hand, left-hand side of that equation in order to be able to identify these uh, associated um, disorders. Um, do we recognize that difficulties following loss can manifest in a variety of forms? These can be distress symptoms, somatic symptoms, functional impairment, risky behavior, developmental disruption. Do our assessment tools reflect an understanding of the high comorbidity between stress-related disorders? 
So trauma and PTSD and bereavement and grief tend to co-occur to a high degree. In fact, trauma and PTSD and bereavement, I should say, trauma and PTSD are reported more frequently among kids who also report suicide ideation than suicide ideation and depression in a study that just came out of uh, my colleague's lab in Utah. And that is primary care setting. So trauma tends to co-occur with suicide ideation, um, at least with the same frequency as depression does. And that's a very important finding for risks for assembling appropriate risk screening batteries. Are we familiar with bereavement support um, resources available in our institution, community, and nationally? And I've got a good number of resources available for you uh, in these slides. Can we identify risk and vulnerability factors that increase the risk for prolonged grief reactions, like the ones that I just reviewed? Do we use this information to gauge the severity of the case? Can we identify resources in the client and family that act as protective factors and mitigate distress? Do we know how to leverage these so that we can um, therapeutically harness them, build them into the case conceptualization and treatment plan? We're going to be training on the core curriculum on childhood trauma at a later training, and we're going to be talking about how to assemble these data into a, into a useful uh, case conceptualization and treatment plan. Can we identify signs of potential bereavement related to functional impairment and risky behavior and developmental disruption? It can be subtle. They don't necessarily come in and say, Doc, my heart hurts and I feel like I've lost a sense of purpose. So oftentimes you have to look at, at indicators of, of impaired functioning or, if you will, recklessness, et cetera, a lowered desire and effort at, at self-care may sometimes be the things that set you off and, and are informative. Can we establish a risk screening and triage referral safety net? This is very important. Can I receive training in how to do that? Can I conduct risk screening and triage? Can we conduct in-depth clinical assessments? And as needed, do we know qualified and trained clinicians or agencies who specialize in bereavement informed care? And can we connect with them and connect our clients with uh, uh, local and national resources, including websites and, for example, a bereavement support facility in your, uh, in your neighborhood? Abby, I'm having a hard time advancing. There we go. Eleven is, do we call and describe prolonged grief disorder using its correct name? One of the most important things you can do is to not mislabel it. It's not traumatic grief. It's not complicated grief. It's not pathological grief. It's not childhood traumatic grief. These names are not functionally interchangeable, and they carry important, they carry different meanings and meaningfully distinct clinical implications. So we encourage you to use the, the correct term. Do you know how to keep updated regarding current and emerging trends? So there are CDC websites and newsletter updates, for example, that will let you know that a new drug, for example, uh, you know, a new illicit drug may have been found, and suddenly now we have opioid-related deaths that are starting to go up. Um, and that's a more recent trend. It used to be another type of drug, for example. Thirteen is how can we advocate for the needs of bereaved people and families in our community? Um, this is oftentimes something where we just don't have an elevator speech down. And I'm hoping that we gave you some, some evidence uh, that you can share with, for example, policymakers, for instance, or um, important decision makers in your community or in your, in your institution about why bereavement itself is worth attending to and is not just simply another piece, another adverse childhood experience. And can we receive training or get staff members trained in delivering treatment that flexibly targets prolonged grief disorder and other com comorbid conditions like PTSD and depression? Okay. Um, if you want to, there's a 12-step procedure, a detailed one that I'm going to make available to you if you would like to. I'm not going to go through it. If you're interested in advocacy, I encourage you to sign up for uh, on the mailing list for Evermore, which does a lot of bereavement advocacy work up on Capitol Hill and at the state level. Um, and so they are the ones who are leading the charge, for example, on bereavement reporting by federal agencies. Okay, basic recommendations for intervention. Here are just some simple things that you can do. If you are a paraprofessional, for example, you're a concerned parent, et cetera, these are things that you can do with bereaved, bereaved uh, people and families. Listen empathically and non-judgmentally. Help them label and understand their emotions. Simply helping people to understand that it's not, it's not uh, necessarily PTSD, it's not necessarily depression, it might be grief, 
in many cases it is, is a really important part of our, our psychoeducation and outreach. Recognize the power of simple gifts. Simply offering um, to make a dinner, for example, or offering a Kleenex to somebody in a group who's, who's mourning a loss can itself say a lot. Reflect and paraphrase not only what they say, but how they say it. And track the tone of their voice and try to ensure that your voice pitch and your cadence maps onto theirs. Oftentimes, people who are bereaved and grieving speak slowly. And it's really important that we slow down and speak at a cadence that they can understand and that feels sympathetic uh, to how, how uh, overwhelmed uh, they feel and perhaps how slowly they're processing things. Grief work is work. Take rest periods and focus on self-care. Suicide ideation can reflect deep longings to be reunited with a deceased or an existential or identity-related crisis. These can be acknowledged and integrated into suicide prevention. I am not saying that because they're grieving, they don't merit a suicide prevention. But in many cases, you can bring in and integrate a, a comment about grieving, like, this just lets me know how much you really miss your brother. Itself can be uh, a, a cathartic release for them. It helps to frame their experience. It helps to validate it. And it's oftentimes it's a nice segue into the self-care part uh, and an other care part of suicide prevention. Bereaved people may need to suppress their grief and postpone it for later, given current demands. It's not, not uncommon at all, especially with caregivers. They feel like they really have to suppress it, and they don't get to bring it out and work on it sometimes until months or even years later, depending on the particular uh, pressing demands that are around them. And family members may grieve in very different ways based on many factors. Some may have witnessed the death, the relationship to the deceased, their particular coping strategy, their age, their other stressors and also their different reactivity to, to reminders. They may have different types of reminders or different ways of coping with reminders. And these can create important disyncrities in family dynamics. And Bill Saltzman is going to be talking about that, I think, in the next presentation. So here are some bereavement assessment tools. I'm going to go over these very quickly. There's a COVID screener for children. Um, there's still the persistent bereavement complex disorder, uh, complex bereavement disorder checklist that is available. Although, as I said before, we're currently working on the prolonged grief disorder checklist. And for adult uh, training and tools, I would refer you to uh, Catherine Shear's site at Columbia University. And here are just simply some resources. I'm going to put this once again in the slides for you. But there are a good number of different types of resources that you can access. I would like to just call attention to Speaking Grief, which is uh, sponsored by New York Life Foundation. It's a really lovely kind of an overview and a primer to what grief reactions are and just emphasizing the fact that grief is really very widespread, but oftentimes it's so privatized or maybe even stigmatized and marginalized that people who really need support don't get it. It's, a, it's, it's touching. Here are more resources. These are, once again, going to be in the slides that we send out. Let me just call attention to one thing. So we have New York Life Foundation, Grieving Students. That's their work. I work at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. We serve the NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. There are a good number of pandemic resources that are available there. Um, let me call attention that there's now a web-based intervention for medical professionals because suicide rates have started to go up among medical professionals. This is deeply concerning and just emphasizes the fact that we are human too and that we need self-care and that we have to prescribe our own self-care with the same due diligence that we do with our patients. Okay, Abby, I'm having a hard time. Okay. Some more bereavement support websites as well. I've talked about the childhood bereavement estimation model. There are more resources at the Family Bereavement Program and so forth. I've talked about a number of these different resources, and these are just simply links to those. Okay. Let me talk very briefly, we don't have that much time, about assessment. I, I get into child and adolescent assessment in particular. We have a mini-me problem. In many cases, we may treat child grief as simply a miniaturized version of adult grief. We may simply take adult measures and make them developmentally appropriate by swapping big words with small words. Is it that easy? We would say no. There are so many different things to consider. The developmental re level, the relationship to the deceased, circumstances of the death, degree of exposure to the death, 
time elapsed since the death, health and well-being of surviving caregivers, impact on the family system, subsequent exposure to trauma reminders, to loss reminders, and the cultural context all can play a role in shaping young people's grief reactions. And therefore, we just really argue against a, a simplistic uh, approach of just simply taking adult measures, administering it to children, and pretending like you're getting a valid measure of children's grief reactions. We have written a number of things on this, and you're welcome to visit our academic website. Okay, we have effective treatments. I am gonna include these in the slides. I'm not gonna talk about them. There's some detailed information about different treatments. Okay, so let's talk about implications for intervention. Trauma and grief component therapy for adolescents, and I've mentioned this before. This is a modularized assessment-driven, individually tailored intervention that can be implemented either individually or in group settings. We have four different modules, psychoeducation, coping skills, group cohesion if you're in a group setting, trauma processing, oftentimes because the traumatic uh, um, nature of, of deaths can encroach upon and interfere with ability to be able to grieve and, and to remember and recollect and feel a sense of connection. So our recommended uh, way of tr working with traumatically or traumatic, uh, tra tragically bereaved you is you always build a foundational skill set Make sure they have psychoeducation, they have support seeking skills, they've got problem solving skills, they've got cognitive restructuring uh, skills and so forth, thought distribution that helps them to be able to think about things in more adaptive ways. If there are distressing circumstances of the death or other types of traumatic experiences, we typically work with that first, although not always. Then there's grief processing, and I'd like to just show you some examples of how we do that. The last module is just simply a recognition of the fact the traumatic experiences and losses are not just things that evoke PTSD and grief reaction. They oftentimes can be very powerful uh, agents that change kids and young adults, even adults' developmental trajectories. They can bend the, uh, their own trajectory over time and alter the course of their own life. I, I talked about that earlier, for example, lower likelihood of uh, progressing from one grade to the next, especially graduating from high school and graduating from college, et cetera. So what we want to emphasize is that psychoeducation and teaching people uh, about grief reactions and post-traumatic stress reactions in module one, it's oftentimes quite fun, it's engaging, but trauma processing and grief processing, oftentimes this is the challenging work right here, but it's also very, very enriching, especially if you when you start to see symptoms go down. But symptom remediation is not the end goal. In many cases, one of the most important things we can do is to remedy uh, alterations of developmental trajectories. And if you have kids, for example, that have dropped out of school, for instance, or that are, that are marginalized school performers, oftentimes addressing that, uh, that um, disturbance in developmental progression, as well as risky behavior, et cetera, oftentimes is a very, very important part of, of treatment. It is actually easier in many cases to get symptoms to go down than to, than to restore adaptive developmental progression. So we really encourage you to give a careful look at disturbances in, in development, as I laid out earlier. Okay, here are some uh, uh, intervention objectives for our, our grief processing module. We provide psychoeducation. We help people understand what loss reminders are and how they're connected to bereavement-related thoughts and feelings and consequences. We explore and share intense negative emotions. Oftentimes, they can be very, very angry, very, very sad, uh, very uh, sometimes vengeful, very, very confused or bewildered. Address ambivalent feelings about the, the, the deceased. In many cases, they might feel like the person who died has some good things they want to take with them, as well as other types of things they want to leave behind. So we have a, an exercise that helps them to do that. We negotiate the relationship from, uh, with the deceased from one of physical presence to one of memory and how to speak about loss and access support. So we, we have them work on identifying trauma reminders and we build that in to helping them to identify their own personal toolkit of coping skills and to develop literally cards that they carry with them, for example, that uh, carry their, their planned 
coping skills. And these are things that they can do by themselves. It might be relax, for example, or you know, exercise or watch TV or listen to music. But there are also things that other people can do to help them. And so, for example, giving a friend a call, for instance, or spending time with a loved one uh, are important. We also do the same thing with loss reminders, helping them to identify those and to be able to come up with their own personal loss reminders and coping skills in relation to those. What we find is that reactivity to these reminders tends to go down and they become a lot more manageable to kids. And so they become less dysregulated uh, with post-traumatic stress reactions, with grief reactions, and so forth. Um, so they have a lot more sense of control uh, because reminders themselves oftentimes are predictable. Sometimes they're not, but at least they have a coping plan and they also know what they are and they know the types of, of uh, skills and things that they can they can use to cope with those. Okay, Abby, I'm having, okay. So what I'd like to do right now in, our, in the time that remains, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples and then I think we'll, we'll kind of close out with a discussion right here. This is the way in which we actually tailor our intervention. We've got a Disney artist, he's a sketchboard artist, and he developed a good number of these sketch, of sketches that exemplify different types of grief-related distress. And what we do is we use these as discussion cards, either individually or in a group setting. You can lay out these cards and have kids sort of talk through and just say, this is a best friend exercise. Let's say this is your best friend. What would you say that she can say to herself? What can she do um, that might be a more helpful way of, of dealing with the loss of her, of her friend? In this particular case, she says, it doesn't matter if I live or die. If I crash, the bad news is I'm dead. But the good news is I get to see my friend again. So we have a, a devastating loss that leads to an existential crisis and acting out a reunification fantasy, and that is if I die, I'll get to see my friend again. So what I like to do is to actually identify the place in the model where I... Uh, um, yes, Carolyn, uh, I'll answer your, your question in just a minute. Um, is to identify the place in the model where we actually think that they're really hurting. In this particular case, she feels like she has to die in order to, to feel close to her friend. There are lots of things that we can do to help her feel close to her friend that do not necessi necessitate dying. Um, so a lot of the, the typical types of grief reactions or grief ceremonies that we do, uh, mourning rituals, for example, and mementos, et cetera, can facilitate that sense of connection. But there are also a lot of other types of things like happy to carry on the things that they, they really cared about, for instance. And existential identity-related distress, right here. She just feels like uh, you know, her best friend is gone and she doesn't have a lot to live for. So there's a lot of meaning-making exercises that we could actually do to work right there. So we want those to reseed. And that what we do is we oftentimes, we can challenge those, but we replace them. Think of the donut and the healthy food. We replace those with more adaptive ways of being able to contend with that challenge. Okay, we're going to do one or two examples, and I think uh, we'll, we'll have a few questions. Now it's, it's your turn. This young lady just got an announcement. I don't care about my future anymore if he's not going to be a part of it. He'll never see me graduate anyway, so what's the point? So here we have a devastating loss precipitates the loss of interest in developmental aspirations and future life plans and preparations. So please type into your your, your uh, uh, comment box here, the type of grief reaction that you think that she's exemplifying right here. Is this separation distress? Is it existential identity related distress? Or is it circumstantial related distress? And indeed. Okay. Abby, can we have it back? Yeah, you should have it back now. Good. And I fooled absolutely no one. Every comment that I saw, you can see how this kind of works, is we can talk about grief reactions, but the particular types of tools that we select are very much based on the individual assessment profile and the types of grief reactions that are prominent. And so this is some way in which we, yes, it, it is a sketch-based exercise, but has a lot of the common elements right here. If you bring it out, you discuss it, it's a best friend exercise, if that were your friend, what would you say? Can you do the same thing with yourself, for instance? What are some more constructive ways that you could be dealing with that if that were you? 
is, is a way in which we can deal with that. I'm going to give you uh, – here's another one. Manner of father's death. Father died early leads to traumatic expectations regarding one's own future. I'm fated to die young, just like he did. What type of distress would you suggest that this is? Is it separation, existential identity, or circumstance-related, or some combination thereof? It's not either or. Indeed. So this is, it, it's kind of like an assessment profile. Those of you who are familiar with the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality in the glory, you can now start to get complex combinations and you can actually start to, to mix these things together. So bottom line is, it can be more challenging if you've got a kid who's not only really distressed over how a person died, but they're really hung up on thinking that they don't have a future because they're going to die in a similar way. They're fated to die in that particular way, et cetera. So we can start to look at different aspects of the profile and which, which are elevated and put together a more complex way of understanding our, our clients. We would say here, there may be some things about the manner of death, including, by the way, if he eats fewer donuts and more healthy food, chances are he might live longer um, and adopts more healthy habits. So you can challenge it in that way, as well as finding meaning-making activities, et cetera. But this is just one way in which we can use this kind of theory um, in a, in a more adaptive, individually tailored way that feels very dynamic and fluid. And so this is what, the, what we've been working on for the last 20 plus years, et cetera, is being able to sort of tailorize and customize this. And we don't have very much time, and so i just like to say, are there any particular questions? Um, what I'd like to say is, you feel free to, to, to write me. I'm going to move forward with, So we have different types of exercises, as I said before. And then there's a – oh, I'll give you one happy thing. This young lady has a better sense of future, and she's now developing uh, adaptive future aspirations, et cetera. And so you can also come in with adaptive types of, of, of vignettes and so forth and get kids to start thinking about how they can overcome some of the major challenges that they've had. And that is a proceed on the existential level right there. Okay? So right here – is all of my information. We're going to be sending this out to you. Uh, feel free to correspond with me, and then you can also download versions of articles at Academia and ResearchGate, Google Scholar, um, and uh, once again, I have a private practice. Um, but you're welcome to, to correspond with me, and we'll, we'll follow up with you uh, with our, our email. And thank you so much for all that you've uh, uh, contributed with respect to your, your, your comments and so forth. I hope that... Um, the passion for this work comes through. Um, it, it really came through when I was working with bereaved kids. Uh, to be honest, uh, they're unforgettable. And I really hope that if you don't work with them as much, that you will increase your level of, uh, of work with them. And it starts with systematic screening and just making sure that you can identify them and either treat them yourself, assess and treat them yourself, or refer them uh, to a provider who can. And that's all part of providing that, that safety net that uh, uh, involves uh, creating a, a bereavement informed system of care. So I'll turn my, uh, my microphone over to Abby at this point. Thank you so much, all of you, uh, for participating. I really enjoyed your comments, and I look forward to following up with you. Hi, everyone. This is Abby again. A huge thank you to Dr. Christopher Lane for an excellent presentation today. And I just wanted to say that if you are – um, in the next hour, I'll be sending a link to the evaluation. Please make sure to complete this evaluation, especially if you are seeking SDRTP or APA uh, continuing education certificates. Certificate of completion and CE certificates will be sent out within the next two weeks. And our next presentation is scheduled for February 5th, 2021, so next week, Friday. And this will be on building family and relational resilience in the time of COVID. I've included the link for more information and how to register in the chat box. And I hope you all have a great day and a restful weekend. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.